You see, it doesn't matter if you've been a drug dealer your whole life. When Jesus walks in the room, drugs begin to vanish. The want begins to vanish. If you're an alcoholic, I understand you feel like the weight is so strong and you can't get out of the grip. But if Jesus just steps in and he begins to walk close to you, then all of the demons that are holding you in and binding you begin to shake and they, they just can't take, they can't hold you any longer. And they got to let go of your children who are on drugs right now. And you see, they got to let go of all your families who are in addictions right now. And, and see, if Jesus just gets a chance to walk in, he's everything. He's everything. There's nothing more vital. There's nothing more vital. There's nothing more effective that we could do in a service but allow Jesus to walk in the room. Because honestly, all we are as preachers are door openers to allow the Holy Spirit to expand himself and we become invisible so that he becomes visible. You see, God wants people who are willing to become invisible so that he can become visible. But here's the thing, even though you're becoming invisible, you're so drenched in his love, you feel so special, you feel so, you feel so loved. God's using you, but you feel like, are you using me? Because you're spectating the beauty of Jesus at the same time. How many of you in here want to be a funnel for the power of God? Let me tell you something. It's not as hard as people want to make it. You know, you need a theologian in order to make the gospel hard. But you need a Jesus in order to keep it simple. I admire theologians. I praise God for them. I learn so much from them. But y'all, in the presence of Jesus, five minutes in the presence of God is better than five hours of our preaching. And maybe, you know, I'm going to say a small sermon here with the time I have left, but maybe the main reason that I came and I felt like maybe the main purpose of just tonight and all the things the church is doing and all the amazing campuses that are coming up and all the incredible things that the Way World Outreach is doing, maybe my part as part of the family, which I've been told tonight I'm part of the family, and that meant a lot to me. I love this family. It's just to remind you of something. In all the doing, in all the greatness and everything, remember the most important thing you can do is when you walk in the room, when you walk in, getting alone and getting on your knees and, and getting with the precious Jesus and remembering what this was actually all about, why you even became a Christian. It wasn't for a bunch of buildings, even though they're important. It wasn't even for a bunch of people, even though they're important. It was because there was a Jesus who understood you when nobody else did. And there was a God who loved you when nobody else loved you. And he's, he's just worthy of some love. When you walk in the room, there's nothing like it. All of Christianity, we keep on, we'll say our sermons, we will build our buildings. We will hopefully be led by the Holy Spirit in everything we're doing in order to impact the world because we are the bride of Christ. We want to be used by God. But honestly, the gospel message is very clear. Jesus, what he did for you, you could have never done it for yourself. He gave himself for you, dying in your place. But listen, now he asks you to give your life back for him. Very simple message, but watch. At the end of the day, every sermon that will be preached, at the end of the day, every great revelation that you will hear will always focus back on the center of this question. Have you gotten alone with God? Can you hear his voice? It doesn't matter if T.D. Jakes is here, if Gavin Tate is here, if Marco is here, if Pastor, anybody that you love, it doesn't matter if they come on the stage, they're preaching to you and the greatest high you get is the size of this pulpit because the minute you leave the building, you have nothing left. So you're running to the building in order to survive. And let me tell you, I understand there's times in our lives we're in such a deep hole. It's just, we got to get to the building. We have to get there because if we're not around believers, who knows what we're going to do? I understand. But there's also a moment that comes when can you actually hear God for yourself? Can you hear him for yourself? Do, do you know what his voice sounds like? 
Are you getting continually tricked by the wind that's hitting the rocks and the fire that's coming all? Is it, is it all about the show for you? Or do you realize that the secret place inside of your spirit is the only place the Holy Spirit connects to? And do you realize the noise honestly was never for him? It was for you so that you could focus in? Do you, do you know God doesn't need our music, but he allows us to have it so we can focus? Do you know Jesus didn't walk around with a sound system with beautiful, amazing instruments like this? He walked around with 5,000 people touching him, getting healed, and feeding people in the middle of a desert, and speaking with no sound system, yet the power of his words were breaking and shaking hearts. And What I'm trying to say is in order to be someone who is effective with the gospel, you don't need this. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 said it like this. Jesus left and he said, I want you to do something. I'm telling you to go out to all the world. I'm telling you to go and minister to all the world. But listen what he says. He says you can't go yet. You're not allowed to leave. Because you're not qualified. Now watch this. You're still unqualified. Because until the Holy Ghost comes upon you, I don't want you to go out to Samaria. I don't want you to go out to Jerusalem. I don't want you to go out to the other parts of the world. Why? Because the resume, my resume, men look at the resume and they look at all the degrees you have. Praise God for them if you have them. Awesome. Men look at the resume and they look at all the tenure that you have, the experience you have. Jesus looks at the resume of the purpose he put for your life and says, do you have the power of the Holy Ghost? Because if you don't have them, you're not qualified to preach the gospel. Why? Because you'll only be able to give half a gospel your entire life. The only gospel you'll give is a spoken gospel, but never a gospel of power, never a gospel of healing, never a gospel of deliverance. Why? Because it takes the Holy Ghost to do those things. And Jesus never once preached without confirming with signs and wonders, without casting out devils, without healing the sick. So see, it's not enough that probably, I'll just say there's a lot of our churches in America who have become okay with just the spoken word with no power, no confirmation of power. But let me, let me give you this, let me just ask you this question. We know we've heard of humongous churches, but honestly, even though they might have great connect groups, let me ask you a question. Even though they have great social programs, which every church needs, if your child is sick with cancer, do you need a motivational sermon or do you need power? If you are in depression and you can't get out of it, do you need another really good word that's just going to tickle you a little bit or do you need power? If, if, you, if your children are away from home and you've tried preaching to them all you can and they're running from you and they're hating you, but you raised them in the Lord and you're wondering what the heck is going on with my kids? Do you need a motivational sermon? Do you need power? Let me tell you, the bride Jesus is coming back for is spotless, beautiful, but she's powerful. She's powerful. Because he's anointed in the power of the Holy Ghost. Be seated tonight. Y'all feel that presence in here? That's the way I like to start a service. You see, if he's already here, he's just going to do stuff whether I know it, he's going to do it or not. He's just going to start walking through these aisles and healing people. He's going to start touching people all around this building. And here's the thing. Here's the only difference of whether you get touched or not. Do you have the faith to expect that he can do anything tonight? If you or one of those people believe that anything could happen at any moment during the service, anything might just happen for you. <laughs> Put on that first scripture. I want to give you an opportunity, just real quick, something I want to talk about. James 127. My family, all of us, we are dedicated to a specific ministry. Our lives are given for orphans and widows. That's what I do. That's what we all do as a family. Every church we go to, every place we preach, 
for orphans and widows. We have 150 children in Guatemala on the top of a mountain with 24 acres that have all come from every kind of horrible, crazy scenario you could think of. But God has been so faithful to them. Just this last year, in 15 months, we built 100 widows' homes and rescued 100 widows from corn stock houses. We give them heating. We give them electricity. We give them stoves. These women, listen, if you think you know what poverty is, you have to go onto the backside of a mountain, foreign country, where a woman is making $1 sometimes a week. Seven children sleeping inside of corn stock homes on dirt with no heater, nothing. 90-year-old women by themselves, 80-year-old women. The salt of the earth, precious gems. Go ahead and play that video real quick. It's about two minutes long. And look at what has just happened this last year, Casa Helena. So bring the lights back up. We're just showing all their pictures. God is so incredible. And uh, so, yeah, it just keeps going through all 103 widows, these precious lives. Look at every single one of those faces. So God is amazing. And what I want to do just real quick is what we do is we give people an opportunity to help these children and these widows. Obviously, these widows have been taken care of. But right here, every usher has a card. This is very simple. James 1.27, pure and undefiled worship in the eyes of God is to rescue the widows and the orphan and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. You see, many of us have worship that we sing songs to on Sunday mornings, but many of us are missing the majority of our worship, which is the actions of blessing the local church, the poor, the widow, and the orphan. And let me tell you something. This is very that you hear this. In the Bible, there are three different wills, W-I-L-L-S, three different, with the will of God, there's three different ones. Number one, there's the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God is something you cannot change. You or I cannot affect it, we can't change it. Give you an example. At the end of the book of Revelation, which is the end of the book of the Bible, and the only one that talks about the future, we see something incredible. We see that we as the church win at the end. Did you hear what I just said? If you've read the end of the book, we win. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think there is anything you can do to mess that up? It's already been written. Right? So in the end, no matter what, 
we're going to win. Sovereign will of God. But the second will of God is called the revealed will of God. That's the Bible that we have. The Bible is full of the will of God that is revealed openly to everybody. And there are a few main things that are talked about through the whole Bible. Number one, the local church. Anytime you get involved with blessing and being a part of the local church, you know what you're involved in? The will of God. Anytime that you bless orphans and widows and the poor and help win souls for the gospel, that's what you're doing. The will of God. This is why this is so important. Because the third will of God is the specific will of God that every single one of us have. Every single one of you have a specific purpose from God. Every one of you in this building, whether you believe it or not. God did not create you just to take up space. He created you for a purpose, okay? So knowing that, here's the issue, though, that we do. 99% of Christians live their life in anxiety. Why? Because they don't believe, they truly have been convinced they found that specific will of God. So what do they live their life doing? Am I in your will? Am I in your will? Am I doing your will? Am I doing your will? Am I in your will? Am I in your will? God, am I doing your will now? Am I doing your will this year? Am I, was I doing your will last year? Am, what, it's just a constant anxiety because there's that specific. Now, here's the thing. When you get involved in the revealed will of God that's in the Bible for everybody to be involved in, the local church, the poor, the widow, the orphan, winning souls. When you get involved, when you get involved in the revealed will of God is the only time you find out the specific will of God. So instead of trying to aim for the rest of your life for the specific, small, whatever that calling was for you, just get involved what is already revealed throughout the entire Bible that is God's will. And when you get busy doing what is already in your hand and giving it to God, he takes what is already in your hand and then you find out what is in his heart. Bible says Moses was called to go to the Israelites, deliver them. What did, what did God say? He said, what's that in your hand, Moses? He said, I got this stick. I got this stick, this staff. What are you talking about? What do you want with this? Do you know that there wasn't one sign and wonder when the plagues came, when the frogs came, when the boils came, when the water was turned to blood? When it, not one sign came that God did not first ask Moses to do what? Lift his, lift that stick. In other words, he said, what is already in your hand, I will use to deliver what is in my heart. If you will just give, what are you? Are you a poet? Do you write things? Why don't you get involved with doing it for the local church? Why don't you get involved with helping young kids who also have that talent? What, what, what is it that's already in your hand? Are you a teacher? Are you a business person? I just want to tell you, if you want to find the specific calling and will of God in your life, Get involved with what already is revealed throughout the Bible. Give your life to it. And I promise you, when you give him what is already in your hand, he will give you what has been in your heart since before you were formed in your mother's womb. So right here, we have orphans that we feed, 150 of them. Every dollar is one meal. So whatever you want to give, we're going to give you an opportunity. If you want to connect with an orphan, here's the thing. 99% of churches don't even know the name of one orphan. And there's 500 million of them just, just in the world right now. 500 million orphans. And you know what? $5 gives five meals. $2. But I want to just give you something for you parents because it's worked in my life. I had times when I went away, when I was in high school in middle age, in my middle school years, when I, I wasn't like turning my back on God, but I definitely wasn't serving him. But because ever since I was born, I never had a time I remember that I lived in my house by myself. My parents were always taking in orphans, even kids who had parents but were never parented. So in my house, there was always people that were living there. Why? Because it ran in my parents' blood, and they believed one thing. And they told me this later, and I just thanked them and thanked them. They thought that if I sow into the lives of a child that's not even mine, God will then sow into the life of my child. 
Why I'm doing this is because I'm giving you parents an opportunity to be able to sow a harvest behind the scenes because many of your children, I can feel it so strong when I was standing there, many of your children are in a place you are afraid. You've been praying out to God. You've been crying out to God. You've been asking him. But there is an intimidating voice that keeps speaking to you. They're never going to come back. They're never going to listen to the gospel. They're never going to come back to church. What are you doing? You've ruined it. It's because of your terrible example. Mom, it's because of your terrible example. Father, you're blaming yourself. You're constantly fighting with anxiety attacks. You can't sleep at night. Let me tell you something. God is bigger than all your mistakes. Let me tell you another thing. God loves your children more than you do. You need to really receive that. If God loves your children more than you do, then God is chasing after them harder than you are. Matter of fact, until you stop talking, God will not be able to start talking to them. Because when your hand is on the situation, many times God does not have room to put his hand on it because your fear causes you to try to control because you're so afraid because you don't want your children to be hurt. So what do we do when we get afraid? We reach out and we try to control. I understand this is not an easy thing that I'm saying, but I want you to know if you really believe God loves your children more than you do, do two things. One, tonight we're going to pray in just a second, and every parent in here is going to lift up your children to God anew right in this place. And number two, if your heart is moved to do it, only do it if that's the case. Start blessing a child that could never pay you back and that you don't even know and start getting the harvest on your children because of it. The ushers have these cards. This is very simple. You're going to take the front picture. You're going to peel it off and you're going to take it home with you, the front picture. This is a prayer child. You get to pray for this child every day. And let me tell you something. They're praying for you. If you are already a partner of ours, thank you. You have 150 children praying for you literally every single day. And the second part is this small part right here, the second page. You're going to take that part. You're going to fill it out, and you got to give it back to us. Don't take it home. Okay, so ushers, if you're out there right now, I want to give you the opportunity to get involved in something that's the revealed will of God. You guys are amazing with this church, but if you are not connected with an orphan, I'm asking you to ask the Lord if he's touching your heart right now. This church believes in blessing orphans. This church believes in blessing widows. Would you raise your hand right now? And the ushers are going everywhere, and they're going to give you a card. Please keep it raised high. Look at all these people. Look at all these people right now who want to get contacted. Who want to touch. They're sowing seeds for their own kids. Amen. In the last couple minutes, put on that scripture just real quick. I want to say something. Put on the uh, next one. Got the next scripture. If you do, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen, look at this, those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been from now on. You will be at war. Listen, y'all. Before there was anything, please keep coming, ushers, keep your hands up until they find you. Before there was anything to call something, there was God. He is omnipresent. What does that mean? He's present in every single moment, not just the future, not just your present. He's present right now in the past. He's present right now in the present. He's present right now in the future. Matter of fact, there is no future for God. Because if there were, he could not be omniscient. Omniscient means he's all-knowing, meaning he can't learn anything. So for him to arrive to a new day and to learn something is impossible. He's already been there. He has no past because for him to be past something means that he's not still there. And that's impossible because he's omnipresent. So right now in this present moment, we are here in 2021. But God is not just here in the present for God. He's with Abraham right now. And he's asking him to sacrifice Isaac right now. He's in the present right now with Moses as he's lifting up that staff and the Red Sea is parting right now. 
He's in the present right now with his son as he has to turn his back on his only son so that he never had to turn his back on you. He's in the present in the year 2025. He's in 2055. Until Jesus comes back, which only the father knows. How does the father know when he's going to come back? Because he's already been there. God does not go Monday through Friday. He only has present, never past, never future. That's why you should trust whatever he says. Because he's only saying it to you now because he's speaking from the future backwards. You didn't hear what I just said. He speaks from the future backwards. So he's standing in the place you're asking him to give you a breakthrough for right now. And he's speaking to you from that place saying, if you change this today, you'll get to where I am. Not to where you can be, to where you already are. Ephesians 3.20 says it like this. He will do exceedingly above everything you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Wait a second. Numbers 23.19 says God is not a man that he can lie. So God doesn't give theories. He has to give proven truth. But how can it be proven that it hasn't happened yet? Well, it's already happened for God. So the reason why he says anything you could ever ask, think, or imagine, he can exceed it, is because God went to the end of all the human race for however long we will go. And he listened to every person's request of what they asked. He saw every person's thought of everything they thought. And he saw everybody's imagine and everything that they imagined. He went to the end of it all and said, I can still exceed it all. So now I'm going to say everything you can ask, think, or imagine, I will exceed. Why? Because he already saw everything you asked, thought, and imagine, and he said, if you trust me, I can exceed it. God doesn't need anything. He's all sufficient. He starts by creating, being a creator, and he looks at nothing, Job says, and he hangs the world on the nothing. He looks at nothing, and he hangs the world on the nothing. How is that possible? Because nothing is still something with God. Nothing's nothing with you. But you offer God your nothing. He says, oh, you gave me a lot of something. God looked into the nothing, the dirt, the nothing, and he goes, what? He looks into the nothing and he goes, what does that mean? It means that you're nothing plus God's <laughs> equals very good. You see, when he created the sun, he said it's good. When he created the water, he said it's good. When he created the earth, he said it's good. When he created the animals, he said it's good. But only when he created you and me did he say you're very good. <laughs> you see, so nothing that is not very good should ever be a part of you. Because the proclamation was made that day, therefore the standard you should hold for yourself should not be any lower than very good. Some of y'all don't treat yourself right. <laughs> Let's not go into that because all the women are going to start hooping and hollering here. Women, do you treat yourself right? Come on now, if we ask the real question now, do you treat yourself right? No, my God. Okay. So, look, he looks at the nothing, he creates them, it's amazing. So he's a creator, but then he creates this being who's walking around. Now, please get this. He looked into the dirt and he went into the dirt. So what happened was the vessel of dirt that was there took breath inside of himself, and the first breath that he breathed out was not his own breath, but borrowed breath from God. Why? Because God is trying to tell you that you cannot do anything without first being consumed by him. I just heard we're out of envelopes. Could we give God a hand clap for that? Listen, y'all. If you want to get contact with this ministry, I promise we will give you an opportunity to do that. We'll give you a phone call. You can do that. Thank you all for supporting. I got to wrap this up. But we're going somewhere right here for just a minute. So God then is a creator. He forms this man. The man then he looks and he says, 
it's not good for man to be alone. What does he be? He becomes the psychiatrist. And he puts the man on the, the pillow and he says, lay down, let me look at you. Something's wrong. It's not good for you to be alone. But man wasn't alone. He was with God. So he's saying there's a difference between having a spiritual partner in God, but sometimes we need something we can take a hold of and we can squeeze and hug at the end of the day and we can look at and they can look back in our eyes and we can feel it because he didn't just make us spiritual beings. He made us emotional beings with a physical body who sometimes needs somebody else to say, can you just give me a hug? So after he's the psychiatrist, he looks at him and he says, okay, 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 I know what's going to happen. He becomes the surgeon and he puts the man to sleep. Now, while he's asleep, single people, please listen to this. While he's asleep, what is he doing? Nothing. He's sleeping. Your job as a single person is to be in surgery. Your job as a single person is not to go on Tinder, is not to go on all these dating apps, is not to go date everything that has genes because you're so afraid, listen, because you're so afraid nobody's going to choose you. That really just says how much you do not trust God with your life. God intended for you to be in surgery. God didn't write a, it, Adam didn't write a list saying, give me the blue eyes, give me the thing and all that. Now, I'm not against lists. It's pretty awesome. If you did that and he gave you that, praise God for you. That's incredible. But I'm telling you, anything you could write on that list, God will give you exceedingly better and beyond anything you could have ever asked a thought. <laughs> so God then from the surgeon steps into another suit and he becomes the matchmaker. And he brings Eve through the trees. <laughs> You know, the whole thing. And then Adam's sitting there and he looks around. Hey! I mean, you know. And he says, whoa, man, right? Woman, oh my gosh. You know, he said, that's, that's pretty awesome. Thank you, God. That's the coolest thing you've ever made. Right? So they come together. And then God, they don't have a chaplain, but God says, oh, wait a second. He jumps into another suit, puts the thing on. Do you take this wife? And uh, do you take this husband? But they don't have a witness to confirm the message in the marriage. So God jumps over here and says, I confirm and I witness this. <laughs> Moses came to God, and when God told him to go to the Israelites, what did he say? Who am I going to say sent me? And God actually had a moment where he said, that's a good question. Because when you're going to get cold in the desert, Moses, I'm going to be a sun that comes down in a fire flame to keep you warm so you never get cold. When you start getting too hot, I'm going to turn the temperature down by giving you a cloud in the desert that follows you all day long. When you start getting uh, feeling like you're getting weary, I'm going to make sure you never get sick for over 40 years. You'll never have to buy shoes again, Moses, because I'm never going to let your shoes wear out. Your clothes are never going to wear out. Everything you ever need, so you don't know any of this yet, but just say, I am sent you. Him, whatever you need. He's all sufficient. Yet God, even though he doesn't need anything, even though he has everything within himself, he still has a desire. He still has a want. He desires to be desired. He wants to be wanted. He seeks to be sought. This God who has no needs still searches for one type of person. He goes on a manhunt every day. He goes on a manhunt every day. And he's going for people whose hearts are fully devoted to him. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter what politics are doing. Because all God is looking for is a heart. That's fully devoted to him. Put Isaiah 30, 18 up. Watch what he just said here. Isaiah 30, 18. The Lord longs to do what? Be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Bless. He longs to do what? Be gracious to you and to bless you. When's the last time you saw God like that? 
Or did you believe God was up there calculating all your mistakes and all your wrongs? And he was the big guy that came. He was the principal. You went to his office and he said, bend over. And he whooped you every time you did something wrong. He's a God who's waiting to be gracious and loving to you. He longs to bless somebody, but he's just looking for someone whose heart is fully devoted to him. You see, Abraham was in a place where he was in a crazy situation. Nobody was with him. But because Abraham was a man fully devoted to God, what happened to him? He was able to survive anything that came his direction. Noah was in a place where everybody was so sinful, the Bible literally says God had to start over. Not one man, the Bible says, was found faithful, but there was one man, Noah. Not even Noah's family was found gracious in God's eyes. But because Noah was found gracious, he says, all your family can come with you. Because one man, you know what that means? That means when a pandemic is going on, when a flood's about to happen, when every kind of century, every century in time for the last thousands of thousands of thousands of years, they all have crises, y'all. They all have battles. They all have wars. They all have pandemics. They all have things. But you know what God looks for in every century? A heart that's fully devoted to him. So you see, in the midst of anything you're doing, watch, there's a woman who comes up and she's a prostitute. This is how we close. She's a prostitute. Play that track. And it says she comes to God. She has to get past all the people, all the people that already talked to her, all the people who have criticized her in her entire life, all the people who said, who is she to come to this house? She's a prostitute. But she comes with a bottle. That bottle is one year's worth of wages, but that's not what the bottle was. The bottle was the symbolism of her heart and her life, everything she had. The Bible says that she steps past all of the criticism. Can you imagine as she's approaching that house? Every woman who's saying, why is she here? Who is this person? Get away. Why the heck would she want to show herself? Is she going in the house right now? Can you believe someone like that's getting close to Jesus? Can you? And she does. She says she passes by because you know what? There's a time in your life you have to come to when you finally say, you know what? My life is no longer about you. My life is about getting to him. My life is about getting to Jesus. I got to get free. I don't care if I got to get in discipleship class at the church. I got to get free. I I don't care if I got to get on the teams at the church. I got to get free. I don't care if I got to, if I'm 50 years old and I need to get discipled by a 25-year-old. I don't care because God won't bless you if you're proud. God blesses the humble. There are some men in here who are saying, I'm willing to do anything to get free. Did you hear what I just said? There are people in here who are saying, I'm willing to do anything to get free. God will send some of y'all a donkey to talk to you. Someone who doesn't know anything, who's way younger, and is an idiot in your eyes. But God will hide his word in that person's voice. Why? Because he's so tired of your pride and he can't get to you. But if you'll just humble yourself and be willing to even hear a donkey, then God might be able to start moving in your life. If you just get over it, get over it, get over it. Do you want to be free? Do whatever it takes to get free. So she's walking to God. <laughs> she's walking. Hey, there's a lot of people about to join the discipleship class, I'm telling you right now. So she... <laughs> so she walks to God. She comes and she lays down and she has the oil. What does she have? The alabaster. What does she do? She, pew. And that sound was not the sound, remember, of just a bunch of oil of one year. That sound was a life broken. A life broken. And the sound was so sweet to the ears of Jesus that even though many other miracles happened, even though many other stories happen, Jesus said, this woman's story will be told for the rest of time. Why, why? Because listen, when she broke it at his feet, she put it on his feet, but Mark said she put it over his head. Listen, it ran through his beard. It ran into his clothes. It ran through his whole body. Why? Jesus was being submerged with the sacrifice of a life broken. 
When's the last time you came into worship not saying, Lord, I hope they play a song I need, but said, Lord God, whatever they play, I just want to submerge you in love today. I just want to submerge you in goodness today. I just want to submerge you in this. I don't have time to critique my neighbor when I want to submerge Jesus in love. I don't have time to gossip about somebody when I'm busy submerging my love on Jesus. It runs down, but listen to what happens. This is so beautiful. Many, most theologians believe, and it's said that that is not just a anointing, but a preparing for burial. And what happened is from that moment, he goes straight to the Garden of Gethsemane. What does that mean? He didn't go home and take a shower, y'all. Why is that important? Because listen, listen. When they take him and arrest him, Judas gives him a kiss. And you know that he wanted to strike out and say, how dare you? How dare you been walking with me and doing that? I know I got to do God's will, but, but what happened? He looks at him and he goes, he smells that aroma of a life given fully, completely for him. And he says, go ahead and arrest me. Because someone was willing to give a life, a heart fully devoted for me. When he goes and they start beating him in the face and it's unjust and he's bleeding and blood spitting out places. He goes and he falls to the ground and when he falls, he... someone was willing to give a life fully devoted for me I can keep going again when they come and they begin to accuse him in front of the courts and they beat him again and then he stays silent why because when he puts his head down he goes oh I want to talk so bad God I want to defend myself but someone was willing to have a heart fully devoted for me when they put the crown of thorns ah when they whipped him on his back, the lash of the lash of the lash, it was in his beard, it was in his skin, the scent of a fully committed, broken life for God, who said, my heart, I don't have much to give you, but that sound of the breaking went into heaven. Someone, every lash, I'm not going to cry out, I'm not going to stop, because someone was willing and had a heart fully devoted for me. He carried the cross, fell at the cross, but somebody had a heart fully devoted for me. When he hung on the cross, he was losing his life, but somebody had a heart fully devoted for me. You see, throughout eternity, there is a sound that is heard in the ears of God. People hear the sound of everything around them. God has a way of tuning out frequencies. And he's listening. devoted to him so he can show himself strong on that man or woman's behalf. Has your focus, have you gotten caught up in everything? Have you gotten caught up on everything that's happening? Have you been digesting the news like it's every meal? Have you been digesting social media and comments? Are you getting caught up? Have you forgotten that the only sound God is listening for is not who's the next president? Not who the next politician is. But the eyes of the Lord are going about the earth. Who can I bless? Who can I bless? Who's not going to get caught up in all this because they know I am just looking for a heart fully devoted. You see, God came and Israel demanded a king, but what did he say? Samuel said, why are they asking for a king? They already have you. But he said, don't be ashamed of them saying they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But watch, when they were looking for a king, God was going on a manhunt. And he went out and he said, Samuel, I found a young man out in the middle of the fields. I found a young man whose heart is devoted to me. He's writing me poetry. He's singing songs to me. He's adoring me. He called me his bulwark. He called me his shield. He called me his safe refuge. And I got to bless that kid out there who's in the nowhere because he's adoring me he's writing songs for me he's loving me as the world is caught up God's going throughout the fields of the world who's singing him a song whose heart 
He's fully devoted. Close your eyes. I want to refocus you. I know things are crazy, maybe in your life, maybe in your family, maybe in the world around you, but God has proven himself time and time and time again that those whose hearts are fully committed and devoted to him, he will show off for you. There's nothing you have to fear. Your life as a Christian needs to come out of the clouds of all of these things that you have to check off. And you will start saying this question to yourself. Have I obeyed the last thing God told me to do? That's the simplicity of your life. Many of you from this moment on, you know the thing you're going to be asking yourself? Have I obeyed the last thing God told me to do. Why? Because if you keep Christianity, this big 30,000 foot thing, you're never going to have the tangibility of a breakthrough. But if you make it simple, if you bring it in and say, Lord, you're just looking for a heart fully devoted, then you know what matters? Have I obeyed the last thing you told me to do? Have I called up my father and forgiven him? Have I told my sister I'm sorry, even if she'll never apologize to me? Have I looked at my children and said, I repent because I talked to you wrong? Have I looked at my husband and said, I'm so sorry? Have I looked at my wife? Have it might involve humbling yourself. I don't know, but God is asking every person in this building, and he has been telling you something. And many of you have been ignoring it for a long period of time, and God still loves you. God's merciful, but let me tell you something. Until you do the last thing God told you to do, he is not obligated to tell you the next thing. He's waiting to bless you. He's waiting to show mercy to you. If you do not know this Jesus, if you do not know him from your heart, you say, I don't know this God you're talking about, but he sounds so loving. He sounds so compassionate. I want to know him. I want to know him. I don't want you to go home tonight. I don't want you to go home tonight without knowing this Jesus. I don't want you to wonder any longer if you have the peace inside of your heart. I don't want that to happen. This is the most important moment right here. Do you know him? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, everybody's eyes are closed. And I just want you right now boldly to begin to lift your hand all across the sanctuary. Do do it now. Do it now. Lift it up. Say, I want Jesus. There you go. Maybe you're saying, I want him again for another time. I had him once. Look at all these hands going up. I had him, but I've turned my back from him, but I'm rededicating. If that's you, lift your hand. You lift your hand. I haven't been serious about this thing called Jesus. Lift your hand. Look in the back and the sides. Keep them up high. Don't be ashamed right now. You're telling him that you love him. You're telling him that you want him. Look at all these people right here. This is so amazing. Everybody say this prayer with me right now out loud. Everybody's a family. Dear Jesus, I love you. I need you. I believe you died on the cross. You shed your blood for me. Thank you for being my father. I need a father. I need a fresh start. Give me a new beginning. I receive you as my God. I believe you rose again so that I could rise again with a new chance. In Jesus' name, I am now your son or daughter. Thank you. Give him a hand. Give him a hand right now. Give him a hand right now. People just came into the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. What I want to do before you guys leave is I want to give you this. I'm not going to do it here because we've definitely ran out of time. But what I am going to do is if you personally say, you know what, I have sickness in my body. I want to give you the opportunity to get healed. All you're going to do is there is a prayer team that is here, people that believe and have faith. Everybody is going to be dismissed in just a second, but what we're going to do for you is if you have sickness, I will stay here and pray with them for the next few minutes. I will personally come and lay hands with you, agree that you will be healed. We are seeing healings all over the world. This is a night for you. This is a moment for you. Thank you, everybody who has come. Remember, please do not take those cards with you, but give them to uh, one of the ushers. Has this been something that's blessed you? Has this been something that's blessed you? Don't let your eyes, guys, don't let your eyes waver. He's just looking for a heart. He'll find you in the middle of nowhere. You might think you're in nowhere, but remember, he holds the universe in the span of his hand. And even though God is that big that he holds the universe from his pinky to his thumb, 
He also at the same time knows the number of hairs on your head right now. And he clothes the lilies of the field and his eye is on every sparrow. What a God we serve. We love you so much. The worship team is about to come and praise and worship. Come up if you're sick. Come up if you need healing. We love you so much. God bless you. God bless you and thank you so much for coming tonight. Awesome. Let's all stand up if we can. If you need prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you guys. I know we ran out of cards. If you want to give towards the orphanage, we have our ushers at every door right now. You could give towards the orphanages, and we'll make sure that money goes right there to help those widows and to help those children there in Guatemala. So if you want to help out, please, at the end of service, you can go out those doors. You can hand the usher um, a gift, and we'll make sure to get that to the orphanage. You guys, Gavin Tate, give it up for Gavin Tate. They did a wonderful job tonight. A heart that's fully devoted. How many are sold out to God today? You're saying, this is me, God, a heart fully devoted. Gavin Tate's wife is going to be ministering this Friday, 10 a.m. here at the Hallmark Campus for all the women. So this Friday, if you're available, women, this Friday, 10 a.m., Gavin Tate's wife will be ministering to the women. And in Friday afternoon, our youth conference, do not miss it. If you got a teenager, if you have family that has a teenager that's struggling and they need God, get them here this Friday night. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this wonderful night. You're searching throughout the world for a heart that's fully devoted to you. And we're saying to you, God, here I am. I'm fully devoted to you. Father, I speak a blessing over each and every person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.